Hello, Namaskar. Welcome to P Guru's Prime Time. Today I have a very new guest. Uh, usually it's a role reversal. That is that I am a guest on her show. Today she happens to be a guest on my show. Gauri Dwivedi ji, Namaskar and welcome to P Guru's channel. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Shreya yes, sir, for uh, having me on the show. So, uh, viewers, many of you may not know all the accomplishments of Gauriji. So, I'm going to take a minute to uh, give you a background of her accomplishments so far. Um, Gauri was born and brought up in Delhi, and she is a multifaceted person with diverse, diverse, I should say, and varied interests in the fields of economy, geopolitics, and the arts. An alumnus of Delhi School of Economics and Lady Sriram College. She's an economist by training, a journalist by profession, and an artist by passion. Having emerged as one of India's leading columnists and writers, Gauri always has a penchant for writing, even during her formative schooling years in DPS RK Puram. I hope you know who started this Delhi Public School. <laughs> yes. <laughs> With over 16 years of experience, she has worked in both print and broadcast mediums in prestigious media houses, including Economic Times, ET Now, and NewsX. She was part of the senior editorial team that launched ET Now. After spending the early part of her career analyzing government decisions at the cross section of public policy, governance and politics, Gauri has branched into analyzing issues related to strategic affairs, diplomacy and geoeconomics. Over the years, due to her rich and diverse multi-sector exposure, Gauri has written, debated and researched on a variety of issues ranging from economy, industry, governance and strategic affairs. She writes regularly in national newspapers, including Times of India, Daily Pioneer, and the Sunday Guardian on matters related to diplomacy, international affairs, and global business. She is the author of Blinkers Off, How Will the World Counter China? The book will be released in mid-August 2021, that is a few days from now, and the publisher is Pentagon Press. And it takes a bird's eye view of the challenges that a belligerent China presents to the world. The book suggests a roadmap that is in sync with the future of warfare, where the world needs to look beyond military threats and instead prepare for information and economic warfare. Gauri is a visiting fellow with USI and has worked closely on white papers and strategic ideation for India's immediate security, cha security challenges. These include those that will stem from the hostilities in South China Sea and its impact on the Indian Ocean region. The second main concern is due to the growing closeness between Pakistan and China. On such strategic concerns, Gauri has conceptualized, curated, and moderated crucial discussions with global think tanks and research institutions like the Hudson Institute and the RAND Corporation. As, India, as one of India's leading classical dance soloists, Gauri is recognized by the Ministry of Culture as an outstanding artist. An avid traveler, she is always open to exploring new places. Gauri, Welcome to P Guru's channel and I'm sorry for the viewers that but I had to say everything that Gauri has accomplished in her rather young life. Thank you very much and once again welcome to P Guru's channel. You've been very kind sir. Thank you so much for a, uh, such a kind introduction and eager to have this conversation. Thank you. Yes. So um, Gauri ji, one of the things that I uh, observe is your timing is impeccable on this book. Um, so, so when did you, when did the concept that you should write this book come to you and then how long did it take and, and, you know, how much research did it involve? Perhaps you can share a little bit because writing a book, in my opinion, is not easy. And, and, and especially 
once the content is done then you go into this edit phase where you are looking at every word weighing it and saying can i remove it can i reword it you know that that thing goes on you are never satisfied as a writer i am never satisfied with what is coming out so just walk us through this experience for us absolutely sir it's been uh, um, an amazing journey to be able to um, sort of put this entire content together it's been uh, about two odd years that it took for me to uh, wrap this up uh, completely and and you know come out with the book uh, blinkers off the idea germinated um, the first time the idea germinated was when the doklam clash started uh, around that time i was thinking that uh, china's rise from here on how does it impact the world and more importantly what will it take to ensure that china's rise does not upend the world equations or the world as we know nobody wants a country to not rise everybody wants that but at what terms those were the questions that i began asking in 2017 when the doklam clash started interestingly in 2019 i had also gone to china and visited uh, beijing for a couple of days uh, and uh, the questions i had in mind were further cemented with my observations on ground and that is when the groundwork began that is when the research started and uh, the writing uh, came much later it, that's when i decided to take a sabbatical from my uh, previous uh, employment because i wanted to put all my thoughts and research in order but prior to that the questions started from 2017 the 2019 trip to china further germinated the ideas and concretized the ideas i had in mind and then the journey of writing started from 2020 and you're right the editor in you is never satisfied with the writer in you so that contest is always on even till the time goes into print uh, the, the book goes into print you will keep thinking maybe i can rewrite this maybe it's still something that is work in progress but i guess that's that's the battle that every author has to fight you know I, i want to show you <laughs> this is already in print this is my book who painted my lust in red uh, it's already in print and look at how many changes i want to bring about <laughs> <laughs> and and this is only like a small part there's still more things to be done um th- th- this is an ongoing process we are never satisfied and i think we should not be also uh, if there's a better word i think we should always search for that um gauri ji see china um at least let me put it this way uh, the last 18 months it's as if we are in a time warp the 24 hours that it takes to go around the sun once is it's like it's compressed into 18 hours or something things are going so fast with so many things happening in all directions that it is very difficult to keep your eye on any one topic now if you take a look at china it is very difficult to understand what they are up to they want to do bri they want to do cpec then they they they, they want to be able to be part of uh, tpp which they were specifically excluded by us but then they still want to be part of that and when they couldn't do it then they did everything possible to try and sabotage that and then they came back in so in in terms of what is happening in china it is all there's a lot of churn now i have read up a little bit on the current premier xi jinping he hasn't even finished 10th class i mean this person has basically learned his skills of survival on the streets of i don't know which kind of city he grew up in but it's a totally totally you know um, street smart you can call it or something of that nature and he's able to wield the club so effectively i mean if if he doesn't like a certain uh, leader of a certain country oof that person is gone uh, today people are still trying to fathom how many institutions in the united states are in the pockets of the ccp the chinese communist party worse he has done all this shielding his population from any kind of news that is adversarial in fact he has the chinese population to believe that this current covid virus was created by us yes 
So, so uh, uh, how much of this uh, uh, finds its way in the book? I don't want you to give all the details, but because there is so many things that happened. For example, U.S. claimed that there was a defector who came, and and then the same defector shows up in a meeting in China. So, I mean, we are. What are we to make of this? From a big picture, since the time you started writing, what kind of directions did it take you? You know, since the time I write, started writing, sir, there has been a regime change. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, Donald Trump made way for Joe Biden, but thankfully there is now uh, bipartisan support uh, that there has to be a concerted effort by Congress, U.S. Congress, to uh, ensure that the China challenge doesn't overpower America and, and its ability to uh, dictate or ensure the present equations stay the same around the world. Having said that, yes, the developments around the world have been very, very fast paced, much faster than what we imagined. And it has a lot to do with the fact that the pandemic really had a massive impact around the world. Uh, countries are still trying to get a grasp of whether or not this was Chinese virus, whether it quote unquote escaped or not. Why is China not allowing a probe? All these things get built into the kind of geopolitical upheaval that we are seeing. And it's not going to end. It's going to increase further. You are right that the Chinese um, population is completely disconnected at some level from what's happening around the world. And the reason for that is the sanitizing of information that takes place. The sanitizing is at an extremely high sophisticated level. Having said that, around the world, there is now a realization that the kind of power, clout, and influence that the CCP wields is far more than what has been till now accepted. Whether you mentioned US, the European continent is now, in my opinion, completely torn apart between those that openly, uh, I can't use the word vassal states because that is something reserved for countries like Pakistan, but completely in the grip of China as against those that still believe that there is a possibility of being able to counter that. Is there, is there an echo, sir, that we sort of need to address? Um, yeah, just there is a little bit when I speak, but that's okay. We are trying to address it in a slightly different way. Please continue. I'm sorry. I didn't want to disturb your chain of thought. Uh, okay. Um, thank you for that. And uh, the second thing I want to say is that outside of America, when you talk about geopolitical uh, upheaval, the kind that has been witnessed in Australia, in Japan, in India, the whole of the Indo-Pacific has been unprecedented. Who thought that finally a country like Australia would grow a spine? It is, it's, it's when I started researching that facts related to the extent of Chinese hold on the Australian economy, Australian politics, Australian universities, and even the Australian think tanks became very clear. But I believe this turn that has started around the world needs to have a logical conclusion. And that logical conclusion has to be, in my, uh, in my humble submission, that there has to be a united front to tackle China. China is far bigger than what USSR was for America to be able to handle on its own. It needs countries together to come and address those multi-dimensional aspects of what a rising China's threat presents to the world. Now, um, Gauri, you are an economist too, so I'll ask you this question. Um, China is forever short of foreign currency. And, and the reason given is, one of the reasons is that, you know, they have to import their food. They have to import a lot of raw material, which they turn in turn, uh, you know, finish, uh, the, uh, take it to finish the product and sell it out to the uh, external market. They, they are a net exporter. But they are essentially an aggregator where the, the component of labor is being managed effectively because of their population. Now, economically, the world continues to buy from China, India included. Now, why isn't the world looking at turning off that spigot? 
Okay. Um, yes, yes, a lot of people seem to have suggested that, sir, and um, th that those suggestions are valid. But one needs to understand the extent at which the Chinese economy works. It is now not just the dominant force in manufacturing, it's essentially the pivotal cog in the wheel. You are right that a lot of manufacturing in China is still assembly and they're still trying to get onto the R&D curve, the technology curve, they're still trying to get onto. But when one cannot deny the supply chains that exist in China. And to be able to uh, undo those, to be able to um, challenge those successfully requires a long-term vision. We like it or we don't. The fact is China is a country that is able to think slightly ahead in the future. That's a challenge that all democratic liberal countries around the world face when they deal with a communist country. The only other exception, the only other example you can think of is Vietnam, which, by the way, has a certain long term plan when it comes to manufacturing. Because there is, I will not use the word consistency, because that's an incorrect word to describe how people live in China. Uh, but the fact is, because of their present authoritarian political climate, they are able to have a long-term view on their economic model. And that is something that countries, whether it's US, France, Germany, Japan, India, need to counter. That stability in the political economic thought needs to come first. We need to have that clarity that if we want to take on the Chinese manufacturing bandwagon, these are our milestones in two years, four years, five years, 10 years. And that is the only way to be able to counter that. I believe Taiwan can play a very important role if one were to counter the, uh, the Chinese manufacturing prowess. Taiwan is a world leader when it comes to semiconductors, but it needs to be given that backing by India. We can come around the fact that we don't have an official FTA because we don't recognize Taiwan officially, but that cannot stop us from creating a parallel ecosystem when it comes to semiconductors in India. If we allow Taiwanese companies to set up those large fabs, those fab units have been talked about since 2005, when Dayanabhi Maran used to be the telecom and IT minister. Unfortunately, we are in 2021, sir. Those fab units need to come. If they do, then the ecosystem gets created. Um, <laughs> I want to touch up on this, how that almost uh, came to India and then fell through. Very, very, very unfortunate. I believe Intel was the company that wanted to establish a fab and one of the conditions it laid down was that they said they need to have their own power generation plant yes. and, and India had a problem with that everybody was screaming East India company blah 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 and 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 you know we have people living in India from the 16th century 17th century 18th century 19th century and 20th century in the 21st century that's true. That's true. So, and I'm glad you mentioned it was Intel. Indeed, it was Intel. It was a very large proposal. And I do believe I was much younger then and I did not understand fully what the supply chain ecosystem really means. But uh, 16 years later, I can imagine what that ecosystem could have been with one single large fab unit. And, and I also want to tell our viewers that outside of commercial fab companies, such as uh, the ones in Taiwan and China, Intel is the only company that fabricates its own chips. Yes. And, and even Intel is sort of like inside looking out. They are trying to figure out like if there was a, a cost effective fab in India today, boy, that would have been giving employment to thousands and thousands. Because this uh, a fab requires so many cottage industries and semi-skilled industries around it. The ecosystem would have been tremendous. It, it's a big loss for India. For some reason, it was a coalition government. They didn't. Uh, they couldn't bring their communist brethren to see things the way they saw, and 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 uh, it just fell through. Now um, let's get back to your book. So you also said that the war is not any more conventional in that it's going to be fought on air, ground, and in water, but it's also going to be on a bio war and as well as perhaps an IT war. Now, if you remember a few months ago, 
uh, there was a news uh, item that appeared in some Chinese dailies. They said that they could effectively uh, sabotage the power grid of Mumbai. I think it was in October 2020. Uh, the, the grid uh, had gone off for 13 hours. And, and, and India had a real hard time scrambling to get, put it back on and bringing it back up. Um, have, how much of this has you, have you covered in your book? In quite uh, detail, because I believe that it is not in China's uh, interest to start a full-scale military uh, escalation. They stand to lose because of that, because of many reasons, including economic interests. But it is the other new age warfare whether it is cyber, whether it is biological, that is where they are really now looking to escalate their tensions. Remember October 2020, when the power grid went off in Mumbai, was a time when there are officially no military escalations. So officially, it is civil time. So if during civilian times, if China has created a propensity to attack the core economic backbone of a country, then one needs to fathom the possibility if there are military escalations. That's the point that I drive in the book. One needs to understand that this is something that even Australia is facing. Australia had a large scale cyber attack in around uh, May and June of 2020. Unlike India, which did not call out China officially. It was a New York Times report and India has stayed away from naming China. Australia did. The biggest think tank, the, the most prominent one, ASPI, said that it was Chinese backed. It was by entities that were linked to the CCP and they stood their ground despite foreign ministries rebutting. So my contention and my, my uh, point in the book has been that the future is going to be through such warfare, which is new dimensional. It allows countries plausible deniability. One can keep claiming that these entities are linked to CCP, but the Chinese Communist Party and the government there will have full possibility of claiming plausible deniability. Attacks have gotten more sophisticated, so it's not so easy to link everything to a particular country. There are multiple ways in which a cyber attack can take place. You can have economic backbone of a country being targeted. You can have malware or spyware being inserted in um, networks. It is not harebrained when people say that Chinese companies can install malware or spyware in your power networks or telecom networks. They can happen. There is a huge chance of that happening. And if they do, even if they don't bring down the network, that will allow a lot of data to be compromised. So, and the other point that I make in the book is that data and cyber war, they don't follow traditional boundaries. So it's not something that only India is going to deal with. It's not something that only Japan can deal with. It's not something that only America can deal with. Joe Biden is also struggling with so many repeated attempts of uh, hacking by China. They've increased. All of this requires countries to come together. Some of, them, some of this can happen through UN. Some of this can happen through a coalition of like-minded countries that can come together. Germany is a, uh, is a world leader when it comes to research. It is a world leader when it comes to innovation. But it needs to be backed by the thought that the future lies in cyber warfare. And we need to collectively fight that. And that is how innovative solutions will come about. Now, um, with your permission, Gauruji, I'm going to uh, tell our viewers that as long as the questions are based on this topic, you're welcome to ask Gauruji questions. Uh, and uh, if, if that's okay with you. Yes. Sir. yes. As, wonderful. So, so viewers do send in your questions and because I'm seeing some very good observations, some of them are appearing on your screen, but when you're talking, you probably can't see what is coming. So it is a little bit difficult. So uh, I, I want, uh, Gauri, I want you to game this out. Xi Jinping has started skirmishes in so many fronts with weapons that are not battle tested. By that, what I mean is China has never been part of a major war. How? What gives him the confidence that when it is real, when things start coming back at you, when people start hitting back, that all his knockoffs 
that's all i look at f16 he has a knock off you know uh, any other thing he has a knock off in china how do you know how does he know that all these things will engage it takes many many years to perfect arms and armaments yes it does absolutely there's a generation of chinese army uh, personnel who have fought a war after yes. vietnam in different conditions nobody's fought a war so yes they don't know what it's like to really be involved in a actual war like situation um, and all their weapons are reports they've been taken stolen copied whatever word you're a man of patents you understand this what is called copying technology um, but i believe there um, i've made a case that china has sort of thought this in the last 10 odd years where they their alliance with russia where their alliance with iran none of this is formalized in a formal alliances like a nato or a warsaw but the intent is very clear these alliances are meant for in utilization of military and strategic interest and convergence of the same now with russia when it comes to the china russia interests they ally on seven fronts first and foremost is their mutual desire of course to change the world as we know but beyond that moscow provides enough and more utility to china which could in, uh, address some of these problems moscow's uh, army is not a paper tiger they fight in half a dozen countries whether it is syria whether it's libya whether it's uh, in iran and, and even if russia may be a pale shadow of ussr it still has enough and more military might it may have no economic might to match but it has enough and more military might those are the aspects that chinese hope i use the word hope they hope that these could be plugged in with their alliances and friendships and partnerships with countries like iran countries like russia countries like pakistan they serve different interests pakistan doesn't serve any of these interests it serves different interests it's a vassal state it provides it provides it's the complete geography but russia provides it the core interests of being able to fight pseudo war games which no other possibility where, where no other possibility exists for china because as i said pla is a pipe paper tiger so um just to add to what gauri ji said uh, the popular thought is that china lost its war in vietnam A and uh, also i want to bring uh, to attention uh, attention to our viewers that you remember the abhinandan incident to this day it is not known whether he sh he shot down an f16 or the chinese <laughs> rip off of that called j17 <laughs> we don't know nobody wants to say anything i mean as soon as this happened america sent a crew who came and inspected and sternly told pakistan you are not supposed to use f16 for offensive purposes it is not supposed to leave the borders and you are you should have gotten permission from us and then it just completely quieted down after that so i mean th these days obfuscation is the name of the game gauri any insights on that was it a j17 or was it an f16 sorry your guess is as good as mine there because that is something that very few people even know um, as to whether there can uh, be more than one possibility is there so i stay away from that kind of uh, i can't hazard a guess there <laughs> so um the book is uh, going to be available on amazon shortly you said like in the middle of august um and uh, Are you also planning on putting it in bookstores, or is it mostly going to be through Amazon or not? So the Chinese virus is going to have, as people say, a third wave very soon. And if that happens, then obviously bookstores are unlikely to really be open for large-scale footfalls. And we'll end up relying a lot on online sales, online promotions, and conversations like these for the world to really sort of uh, pick up that book. which talks about how we need to come together because the challenge is multifaceted the response has to be also multilateral thank you very much gauri and i wish you all the best for your book and uh, we kind of figured out this echo problem except that uh, my editor needs to be fast on the trigger 
he, he took care of it this time. A little bit late, but he just took care of it. So here are some questions. Uh, can we have the first question, please? It will appear on the screen also, if you can read it. Yes. So um, China is trying to swallow Formosa slash Taiwan to capture chip semiconductors manufacturing and challenge the USA. This is by Lakundi Ananda Pramod. What are your thoughts? Do you think China will invade? Because this is a red line that they are going to be crossing. America needs those fabs, those chips. It's not going to be an easy one. I don't think China is going to actually invade Taiwan anytime soon. They will do so probably five, six years later when they have become economically far more stronger than what they are right now. They are banking on liberal democracies around the world to continue uh, their present situation and their present response to the Chinese challenge, which is uh, incoherent and which is most certainly not collective. And that is what will allow China to become stronger. But in the interim, the fab units, and so, you know, just to say it very simply, the semiconductor industry has a deep link between US, China, and Taiwan. It's almost incestuous how they work together. So the US supply lines for semiconductors are linked to Taiwan. But Taiwan's manufacturing capabilities are linked to China. So it's, a, it's an equation that works together. The only way China can change this is, of course, by bringing some of it onshore. But that is where the American economic and manufacturing might can stop it. It will not obviously come to America. It has to stay in Taiwan. But alternate geographies like India can become the option and alternative that is likely to be more powerful going forward. Thank you for that. And let's have the next question. Chaitanya YSK. Madam, I have been studying China, their political structure and their history. But why do I feel that BRI is a trillion dollar scam as nearly 45 out of 118 are in Pakistan? What are your thoughts? So BRI is essentially the backbone of China's vision for its place in the world and Xi Jinping's vision for his uh, place in Chinese history and also the constitution, BRI is in the constitution. Uh, as far as the, the projects per se is concerned, yes, they have been um, very unsuccessful in particular geographies where they've left the countries high and dry they've left the countries in deep debt. Pakistan is important for two reasons. One is it counters India. I say that in the book as well, that Pakistan's core interest for China is not just the minerals. It's not just because it's a very mineral intense and resource rich area. Pakistan's core utility for China is that it counters India. It ensures that India's geostrategic orbit, which is its neighborhood, remains tense and that will ensure that India finds it difficult to become the pivot to China in the Indo-Pacific, which is why Pakistan is so important for China. And that's the reason why you have so many of these projects that have taken place there. The first set of projects also came about in Pakistan. It was the Karun Power uh, project that started in Pakistan. The, the economic viability of these projects don't matter. They never did, they never will. What will happen eventually is that countries that are not able to pay the debt will obviously be signing up their projects and their uh, entire entities to China, like the Humbantota project and the Humbantota port. Those countries that are able to service it will continue to do so for God only knows how long the Belgrade Budapest railway line, the last set of data that was done suggested that to make a profit for Serbia, it will take 2,500 years. Oh my goodness. 2,500 is a long time. Um, 
one one uh, shout out to our viewers we have a, a series of stories about china this week and the one that you should also look out for uh, in addition to elmer un's uh, hangout is the one with professor rv that we are going to have on friday where he's going to highlight and i'm going to ask this next question uh, i'll come to the will viewers question later but i want to ask you a question see quietly now china has signed another construction deal with sri lanka and this despite the knowledge that the first time around india said they won't build the hamban tota port and they said that that's how we went to china they are in one bad situation there but now they have joined they have uh, allowed china to build an artificial island just outside colombo and that is in between india and uh, sri lanka so basically it also pushes out their international waters more importantly it has it is going to become a listening post for the lumpens that make up many of the political parties in tamil nadu and and uh, kerala is a cpim these guys think that uh, the their mother mother country is china them they used to think it was russia but now russia itself is saying china is the mother country so they are also saying you are our mother country how do you see these developments they are they are disturbing and they need a, a very very coherent and immediate response we seem to underplay the strategic thought behind how the chinese strategy has worked there is a, a traditional ancient chinese game called vt which is unlike chess it's a board game uh, like chess it also has board game it has two adversaries to try to win the same format but vt which is the ancient chinese game always and always focuses on strategic encirclement of the adversary slowly and steadily it almost seems the replication of the same thought when it comes to the the string of pearls strategy that china has used when it comes to the indian neighborhood i say the word geo strategic orbit again because this is india's extended backyard this is the area of indian dominance whether it is sri lanka whether it is maldives seychelles all these has very deep cultural historic civilizational links with india but in just a matter of couple of years they've almost been snapped and that is exactly what is playing out in sri lanka sri rajapaksha brothers they are china champions that's the word i've used in my book so you can't counter china champions but what you can do is as just as a thought i i have presented in the book that while they may not sever their ties with china but what if a research a project or a research offer comes in from india plus france france remember has the second largest exclusive economic zone in this entire region so it's very prominent or india plus us that collectively could come about as a research uh, a marine research project which could give the sri lankans the opportunity to reduce their china um, dependence that could be some sort of opening or a window for india to sort of come back into the game because right now sri lanka has veered completely uh, to to the chinese um can you have the next question please china has invested heavily in supercomputers and quantum computing how can india counter it do we have a strategy for it three how many people uh, in the government think about quantum computing as as an idea whose time has come or supercomputers who are now the need of the hour i think that's a concern that i'm sure your viewers are also expressing at this stage that i also express i just want to point out which i said earlier also that when china thinks because of their political economic setup they are able to think long term the 2035 vision that they have right now only and only is based on technology in 2020 they unveiled it in the 2025 make in india make in china project is also completely backed by technology 
so we need to have that kind of clear eyed vision about our future about our explicit um, role in the future of technology and that is where we need to be clear eyed about supercomputers also. um thank you atul uh, there is a viewer who has just weighed in that china has 200 supercomputers whereas india has only 3 um see for the longest time you know uh, india uh, has a set of people a set of political parties who think it is bla blasphemous to even talk about a computer and 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 these lumpens are still around i mean what, just when you thought that cpim has been routed in bengal and tripura yet they have resurged in in kerala and and what this is the biggest conundrum i don't think i can figure this out in my lifetime which is how is it that the most educated slash literate state of india is also the most curmudgeonly you can go and look up what that word is and 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 basically what it means is that i will do what i think you are wrong they don't care what you are saying they are saying you are wrong right out you can argue with them till the cows come home they'll say you're wrong and and this has been continuing on and on and on and on so um india has this lobby or or group of political parties who live and die by their opposition to computers any government in power needs to take them along even if they are in the opposition how do you think government should be approaching this i'm not going to ask you how this government did or the previous government did let's not put that how should we as uh, the government be approaching these people and saying wake up smell the coffee even your big motherland also has so many computers therefore you should be supporting i mean how do you go about doing this there, there are no easy answers uh, electoral politics is tough and so is governance and thankfully we are not living in the era of coalition politics but even even with a, such a strong majority in the government right now we need to have certain maturity in being able to finish decision making in a time bound manner i think that is where we need to be very clear uh, about how long will it take for us to take some of these very important decisions you know even if we start today you understand technology very well sir even if we start today the germination project uh, time for something like this will be a couple of years and for it to start showing results will also take some time so we need to wake up as of yesterday for it to show results tomorrow <laughs> you know uh, many may say that opposition politicians and maturity is an oxymoron so next question please Kwerty man wants to know what do you think China's objective at Galwan was? Was this merely a psychological ploy, or was there something deeper? Your thoughts. Your thoughts. Hmm. So Galwan was culmination of about a decade-long strategy where China managed to gain a lot of psychological advantage over India by gaining foothold in its neighborhood, by gaining a lot of clout. and influence inside and outside india and gaining enough and more economic muscle all three of these collectively came together when china decided that it's time to now flex those muscles and for india to be told that there is only so much you can do and there is only so much you can go when it comes to taking on china it was also a message that if india grows deeper ties with an america with america then this could be the backlash that it will face and it was also meant to indicate to new delhi that don't think that washington is going to come back for you or for your defense because they are a continent away we are your neighbors you can't choose your neighbors just like you can't choose your parents and you've got to live with china and you've got to have that strategy in place I think Galvan was that wake-up call for India, and it was a culmination of a decade-long strategy for China. So, so India did get caught by surprise. But what was your takeaway that India did push back hard once they realized what they were up against? No, yes, they did. They absolutely did. 
and uh, more importantly they also gained a lot of vantage points in early august and uh, salute to our uh, uh, army and unlike the pla which hasn't fought a war in 40 years uh, indian army has been on battlefields so difficult for the last 40 years constantly so our jawans uh, they have everything there are in, that is needed for preparation and more which the chinese didn't so while they had the first mover advantage what we had was the terrain advantage we knew that back uh, like the back of our farm and we had those vantage points which only time will tell as to why we chose to um let go of next question from chaitanya ysk uh, can you go back to the previous question please thank you madam did you do any research on chinese threat to russia do you think china is waiting to swallow siberia after putin so china's uh, the whole mirage that they've created that xi jinping has created that we need to avenge our century of humiliation and we need to go back to our golden age somehow now that includes russia vladivostok which obviously was part of the 350000 square miles that russia took is not part of any of this mirage of century of humiliation being avenged simply because i mentioned that earlier to you also that russia serves far bigger purpose to china than just a single territory it's important but what's more important is the power of compounding that she plus putin bring on the table whether it is they're coming together in the middle east whether it is their collective military might which could be a significant and a very potent weapon against the quad in indo pacific or whether there is their combined ability to bulldoze whatever is left of the un in terms of decision making so all those are far bigger ramifications than just territory so i don't think at this stage russian territory is going to be very important for xi jinping and just like she is going to be around because he is president for life so is putin so if your <laughs> guess is as good as mine who is going first <laughs> Well um there are a lot of uh, undercurrents that are happening within China and viewers you should watch the videos that I'll be putting out uh, with Elmer Yuan he's a uh, he's lived uh, two thirds of his life in China and Hong Kong so he knows a lot of things about what's happening the palace intrigues if you will so you'll get some insight into that next question Lakundi Ananda Pramod if indians intend to learn and understand chinese slash mandarin we can utilize taiwan to do so but goi is yet to declare open support to taiwan independence or allow its embassy in india i mean how does one proceed further from here independence or its sovereignty is accepted by about dozen odd countries in the world and that's the biggest irony those who are trying to save it don't recognize it on their own right america doesn't recognize taiwan officially they have a cultural center everybody has a cultural center uh, in taiwan but the way around it is that one needs to bolster economic ties with taiwan reduce its dependency on china 50% of the taiwanese economy is related and dependent on china if that comes down first to 30% and then further with deeper trade links with other countries that itself will be the single biggest uh, way to save taiwan um next question please oh okay i got it one of the oldest chinese knowing i mean someone who knows the chinese happens to be dr subramanian swami unfortunately government of india does not utilize his services to solve its issues with china in fact uh, even indira gandhi did so uh, you, why is this government not making the best use of the limited expertise that it has in its armory i really wish i had an answer to that uh... Uh, but you're right that you know dr swami uh, I, i'm sure you know it but maybe some of your viewers don't that he actually did his phd on the chinese economy 
It was with Paul Samuelson. It was focused on reading and understanding the Chinese economy. And those insights can be best utilized as we counter uh, China right now. We need to have a response to the Chinese economic might. And that can only come when people like Dr. Swami can uh, be allowed to give him their uh, expert view. And uh, I think that's the last question we have. Uh, it was a pleasure uh, talking to you, Gauri. We saw a totally different view of you, a dimension of you that perhaps doesn't come across when you were hosting programs. I know it's all like five fighting, crying children, all trying to wipe out your attention. So here it's slightly different. But I'm, I'm hoping that we can have you back for more such uh, hangout. Hang on, there's uh, one question, I think. Yeah. I, Anima Gunn wants to know, didn't anybody suggest you to demarcate Tibet from China for your book cover? That's a tough one, isn't it? <laughs> um, okay. Uh, there are no easy answers to that. Just like there are no easy answers to Taiwan. But the book is very clear about how to counter China going forward. I hope you pick up a copy and read and share your thoughts on that. And as always, as Professor R.V. says, buy the book. You don't have to read it. Although in, in, in this case, we have to, uh, you know, uh, encourage a new author. And I would definitely want you to read that. It's a perspective that is not often uh, shared, you know, and, and Gauri has done a lot of research. I went through uh, some portions of the book. I, I'm really, really impressed, Gauri. You are, you are a multifaceted person and, and you've had these talks about culture, art, and other things also. So it's, it's truly a pleasure and honor to be able to host you for this. And, and hopefully there are more books you will write and we'll have more such hangouts. And also in other things also, I'm hoping that you, I can bring you in for your opinion on some specific topics. Thank you very much. Namaskar. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much for the time.